Hello and welcome to today's lesson where we're going to look at SI units in the measurements and errors module in A-level AQA physics. So in today's lesson what we're going to do is we're going to try and define and use SI units in different physics concepts which links into the measurements and errors uh, module in AQA A-level physics. So if it's successful and we learn in today's lesson we can state and define the different SI base units, convert from SI to non-SI units and vice versa and use SI units to derive the SI derived units of physical properties, which links into the following part of the AQA A-level physics specification, 3.1.1, the use of SI units and their prefixes. Now, physics is the study of how the universe works and what makes things happen in the universe. So to observe this, we've got to measure quantities, and these quantities need a scale and factor. Now, this scale and factor is the unit that goes alongside your measured quantity. Now in physics the unit is just as important as the numerical value so if you give an answer without a unit the answer is incomplete as you don't know the scale of the value. In the real world it's essentially meaningless. So to give a complete answer you've got to put units on your values as this gives a scale to your value and in addition the unit can work out can give you an idea of the formula that you require to work out this value. So, for example, we know that resistivity is measured in ohm meters, so we therefore know that a resistance times by length will equal the resistivity. So you can work out what the formula of that quantity is going to be. Now, this idea is called dimensional analysis. Now, the dimension of any physical quantity expresses its dependence on the base quantities as a product of symbols or powers of symbols representing those base quantities. Now, the importance of the concept of the dimension comes from the fact that any mathematical equation that relates physical quantities must be dimensionally consistent. So, therefore, every term in an expression must have the same dimensions because it doesn't make sense to add or subtract quantities of different dimensions. And in particular, the expressions on each side of the equality, the equals, in an equation must have the same dimensions. And the arguments for any of the standard mathematical functions like sine and cosine and logarithm and exponential that appear in an equation have to be dimensionless because these functions require pure numbers as inputs and give pure numbers as outputs. Now if either of these rules is violated, an equation is not dimensionally consistent and cannot possibly be a correct statement of physical law. So this simple fact can be used to check for typos or algebra mistakes in an equation, can help you remember the different laws of physics and can even suggest to you that there must be a new law of physics if it doesn't actually make sense from what you knew previously. Now, in an examination context, carrying out dimensional analysis is a quick way to check if the equation you are using is correct or if, in fact, you've made a mistake writing it down. Now, if your quantity has no dimensions associated with it, then it's called a dimensionless or pure quantity. Now, as we mentioned before, we've got to look at the different units used in physics. Now, to avoid different scientists and different projects using different units in their work, it was decided that scientists must all use the same units for quantities that they measure. And the standard system of measurement used in science and in physics is called the International System of Units, or Système International de Units, or SI. And it's the modern form of the metric system and is the most widely used system of measurement and it comprises of a coherent system of units of measurements built on seven base values. Now all scientific answers should be given in SI units or SI derived units. If you give an answer in a non-SI unit there must be a special reason for this. So the motivation for the development of the SI units was the diversity of units that sprung up between different countries and the lack of coordination between the various dis different disciplines such as chemistry, physics and biology that used them. And in the Meter Convention of 1875, it brought together many different international organisations to not only agree on the definitions and standards of the new system, but also agree rules on writing and presenting measurements in a standardised manner across the world. And the international system of units has been adopted by most developed countries, but it's not been universal in English-speaking countries. So for example, Burma, Liberia and the United States have yet to adopt the SI system.
Now, the SI system treats seven physical quantities of a closed system as fundamental. Now, these are called the SI base quantities. This means that they're absolute quantities in physics. They are quantities which are fundamental to the existence of the universe. These are the base quantities which can be used to describe everything in the universe. So, what are our SI base quantities? We've got length, time, mass, electrical current temperature, amount of substance, and light intensity. Now, we can. these are the SI base quantities. All of the other quantities in the universe can be derived from these seven base quantities. So these are what we call the SI derived quantities. Now, our SI base units for our base quantities are as follows. The, the meter, the second, the kilogram, the ampere or amp, the kelvin, the mole, and the candelar. Now, these SI base units are very important. Whenever you use these quantities in physics, you've got to use those base units. Every other measurable value in the universe can be found from these properties. These seven quantities describe the physical universe. When you're asked to express a quantity in SI base units, you must write the unit in terms of those seven units. So here you can see the SI base units, the basis of all scientific measurements, because all scientific measurements are based on those SI units. So we've got one kilogram, one second, one kelvin, one amp, one meter, one mole, one candelar. Now in science we consider the SI base quantities fundamental and those units quite fundamental but that is a human construct. The basis for each SI unit is arbitrary so it's designed by humans. There's no profound meaning to eat to any of them. Basically they're not special. We have made them up. They are based on human intuition with the universe. Now for you your exam you don't need to know the official definition or historical context of the SI units but it is interesting and allows you to understand the units better. So the origin of the meter goes back to the 18th century. At that time there were two competing approaches to the definition of the standard unit of length. Some suggested defining the meter as the length of a pendulum having a half period of one second. Others suggested defining the meter as one as one ten millionth of the length of the Earth's meridian along a quadrant, which is one fourth the circumference of the Earth. In 1791, soon after the French Revolution, the French Academy of Sciences chose the meridian definition over the pendulum definition because the force of gravity varies slightly over the surface of Earth, affecting the period of a pendulum. Now, the meter was therefore intended to be ten to the minus seven or one ten millionth of the length of the meridian through Paris from the pole to the equator. However, the first prototype was short by 0.2 millimeters because researchers miscalculated the flatten of the earth due to the rotation. However, in today's science, we define the meter as the length of the path of light traveled in a vacuum during a time interval of 12997924858 of a second. Now, the kilogram is another SI base unit. At the end of the 18th century, a kilogram was a mass of cubic decimeter of water, and in 1889, the first CPG sanctioned the international prototype of the kilogram, which is made of platinum, iridium, and declared this prototype should be known as the unit of mass. Now, the kilogram is actually kept at the International Bureaus of Weights and Measures near Paris, and a copy of this is kept in an airtight vacuum at the National Physics Laboratory in London. However, when we actually measured the prototype again in 2009 it was no longer one kilogram as it gained mass due to chemical reactions with the atmosphere so the mass we use to define the kilogram no longer weigh it has a mass of a kilogram now the second was defined as originally as a fraction of 186 thousand four hundredth of the mean solar day. However, the measurements show that the irregularities in the rotation of the Earth could not be taken into account by this theory and have an effect that this meant the definition was not accurate. So today we define the second to be the duration of 91926317770 periods of the radiation corresponding to the transition between two hyperfine levels of ground states of the cesium atom. Now the ampere is the constant current which if maintained in two straight parallel conductors of infinite length of negligible cross-sectional area and placed one metre apart in a vacuum will produce between the conductors of a force of equal 2 times 10 to the minus 7 newtons per metre of length. And the definition of the Kelvin was given to 
form the triple point of water as the fundamental fixed point and assign that to have a temperature of 273.16 Kelvin. So the Kelvin is the fraction of 1, 1 over 273.16 of the temperature of the triple point of water. Now, physicists and chemists have agreed to assign a value of 12, exactly as, as the relative atomic mass of the isotope of carbon with a mass number carbon of 12. So the mole is the amount of a substance of a system which contains as many elementary atoms as there are atoms in 0.012 kilograms of carbon, which uh, the chemist Amadeo Avogadro worked out to be 6.02 times 10 to the 23 particles, which this is Avogadro's number. Now, the candle R is based on the emission of a black body which is a theoretical object which emits all the radiation it receives and the unit is based on the emission of a black body at the temperature at the freezing temperature of platinum which is 2045 Kelvin and it links into the amount of uh, the, the intensity of monochromatic radiation of frequency 512 hertz which has been emitted uh, out into the universe. Now you've got to also be able to convert between SI units and non-SI units. Now that also includes our SI derived units such as the joule, the newton and the watt. So this is very very important. So here you can see some standard non-SI units that are used in A-level physics. We use them for the ease of calculations and scale and certain situations uh, where for example it could be difficult to calculate distances in space in meters so we use other non-SI units. Another example would be when we look at the energy of electrons in atoms the unit of the joule the SI derived unit is too big so the electron volt EV is used. Another example is when looking at the masses of large vehicles the unit of the kilogram is too small so we use tons instead. Another example is when we look at the distances between stars the unit of length uh, in meters is too small so we use the unit of parsecs or light years instead so there are actually some non there's some very unique non si units which have been used in physics such as the banana equivalence dose which is used as an everyday measure of radiation the barn which is a unit to measure the cross-sectional area of the atomic nuclei the crab which was then also used to look at the intensity of emission from um, nebula in space. The Dirac, which some people have said is defining as the how quickly someone can speak. So one Dirac is one word spoken per hour. The Smoot, which is a unit of length defined as the height of the MIT graduate or undergraduate Oliver Smoot. Okay, so there's also some very, very interesting ones. There's the Shake. So in the nu in nuclear and astrophysics contexts, context the shake is equal to 10 nanoseconds and comes from the uh, phrase two shakes of a lamb's tail and then we've got a micro mort which is a unit to quantify risk that's equivalent to a one in a million chance of death and another idea will be the decimal hour or the second or the minute because in post-revolutionary France they introduced a decimal time system where the day was divided to 10 decimal hours each of 100 minutes leading to a decimal minute of 1.4 standard minutes and a decimal second lasting 0.86 standard seconds. However, it only lasted for two years before they then went back to the original uh, system. Now, what you've got to be able to do is, unless stated in the question, you've always got to present your final answer in SI units. You've got to convert them. So to convert between SI units and non-SI units, in the first step, you find the value of the wanted unit in the given unit, which is the conversion factor, and then you multiply the value of the given unit by this conversion factor. So, for example, how long is the 13.1 mile Great North run in metres? So the first stage that you do is find out how many meters are in a mile. You then multiply the number of miles by how many meters are in one mile, and that gives you your answer of 21,078 meters. Another example could be how long is the 400 meter race in miles? So you find out how much one, one meter is in miles, and you then multiply the number of meters by how many miles are in one meter, and you get your answer to be 0.249 miles. Now, 
in some examples you're actually required to divide by the conversion factor instead of multiplying. This occurs when the quantity is the denominator in the equation. So in the equation speed equals distance over time, time is on the denominator so if you wish to convert the time value the value must be divided by the conversion factor as it's the denominator. So for example convert 20 meters per hour into meters per second. Well you work out how many seconds are in one hour so one hour has 3600 seconds so you divide your value by 3600. In addition if the conversion factor is given in the opposite quantities you'll have to divide it. So for example convert 100,000 ton, uh, kilograms into tons if you know there's 10 to the 3 kilograms in a ton you would then need to divide to get your answer of 10 tons. Now, you've got to also be able to find out the standard units of any property and the valid answer if you're struggling to memorize the units of values. So again, this process to work out the SI derived unit of a quantity is called dimensional analysis and all examination answers should be given in SI base units or SI derived units. So for example, we know the commonly used unit of power is the watt, okay? but this is the SI derived unit because it's not one of the base units. So we can express the, power, the unit of power in the SI base units. So remember, any unit which follows the SI system but is not a base unit is called an SI derived unit. So remember our SI base units are meters, seconds, kelvin, candela, amperes, moles and kilograms. Examples of SI derived units include watts, ohms, joules, volts, hertz and examples of non-SI units could be miles, hectares, hours, inches, furlongs, parsecs. So you've got to not only be able to convert from SI to non-SI units and vice versa, you've got to be able to express SI derived units in SI base units. So to do this, you write out your, out your equation for your quantity. So we know that power is equal to work done over time taken. Now this is found on the equation sheet at the back of the examination paper. What you then do is place your SI base units into this equation, which describes the quantities in your equation. So we know work done is measured in joules, and we know that time is measured in seconds, so it's joules over seconds, so it's joules seconds to the minus one. Now you can use this dimensional analysis to relate the SI derived unit to the common scientific unit. However, this, there's an issue in this particular idea, because Whilst we've got power is equal to watt, which is not expressed in SI base units, so we, that's the SI derived unit. So we said power was work done over time taken. So power is equal to joules over seconds. So one watt is one joule per second. However, this is not the final answer because the joule is not a base unit. So what you've got to do is break it down further to get into the base units. So what you've then got to say is look at what one joule is now uh, work done is force times by distance and force is mass times acceleration so you can work out the base units of the dual by doing that particular equation you substitute it in and you get your answer to be kilogram meter squared seconds to minus two now the common scientific unit is easier to say and it pays tribute to the famous scientist now the SI derived unit is a more fundamental way of representing the quantity and allows you to understand what measure need be made in an investigation. And we can also use dimensional analysis to work out the equation of a value from the units of a value. So for example, speed. We know speed has units of meters per second or m slash s. So we can write that as m slash s, m s to minus one or m over s, all are appropriate ways to write that particular unit out. However, it's preferred that you write it with the indices. So for example, it's better to write k m to the minus three as opposed to k over m cubed. Now, it doesn't matter which order you place your values in on the page, it's all the same, so any answer will be accepted as correct. Now, because speed has units of meters per second, this indicates the quantity is derived from dividing a distance quantity by a time quantity, so therefore you know speed is equal to distance over time. This is deriving an equation via dimensional analysis. So to summarize what we've learned in today's lesson, we know the fundamental base units of the universe, the use of mass, length, time, 
time, amount of substance, temperature, electrical current, and the associated SI units. We know the derived SI units, and we have knowledge and use of SI prefixes, values in standard form. We can also use the prefixes and convert between different units of the same quantity. So if you've been successful and you've learned in today's lesson, you can state and define the different SI base units. You can convert from SI to non-SI units and vice versa, and we can use SI units to derive the SI derived units of physical properties. I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson on SI units in the measurements and errors topic of AQA A-level physics. Thank you and have a lovely day.